Welcome everyone to the National VTS Session 12. Um, so today we're going to look at diabetes, tips for starting a new job because a lot of people have changed over and then a Q&A you can ask anything about GP training or GP careers. Okay, so let's make a start. So as I said, what we're going to do is we're basically going to have two main talk sections and then there'll be an open question and answer session. So we're going to focus on diabetes as an update. We'll look at diagnosis, management. We're then going to look at tips for starting a new job or rotation and then the Q&A. So in terms of diabetes, I just want to make sure that you're all up to date with the current guidelines, both for diagnosis and management. And this could help you whether you're starting to think about your MRCGP AKT or MRCGP RCA, or for those of you just you know, consulting every day in general practice, uh, you might be already a qualified GP, you might be starting your first rotation in general practice soon, and you're going to come across some of these things and you might not be familiar with some of them. Okay, um, so we'll start with a, a couple of AKT questions. You'll have 57 seconds to look at the question. Here we go. Here's the first question. 57 seconds. This is a hard topic and it's a very hard question. There's a couple of things that make this question particularly challenging. So let me just turn my video back on. So one of the things that makes it challenging is this is what we call a multiple best answer. I can see it asks for which two. So in the AKT, for you to get the one mark that's available for this question, you have to get both bits right. You get one bit right and one bit wrong. You do not get any half marks in AKT. You either get one for a question or you get nothing for the question. Okay. And then what else makes this challenging is this is what we call a negatively framed question. Can you see the question is asking which two of the following test results would not be suitable to confirm a diagnosis of diabetes? Okay. So not be suitable means not suitable for this patient in this scenario. Okay. Now, if you look at the spread of answers, the two most popular answers are A and B. Okay. So these are the two most popular answers. And then we've got a spread really between C, D, E, and F, they're fairly spread. Remember, you need to get them both right to get the one mark. So the correct answers are C and F. Okay, so C and F. Now, very few of you got both C and F right. Some of you got one of those, but because you got one of the others, you got a partially correct, you get no marks for partially correct answers in the AKT. You get nothing. Okay, and the two most popular answers, fasting glucose of 7.4, random glucose of 11.2. Um, are incorrect. Why are they incorrect? So let's look into technique. You see, some doctors that lose marks or ultimately fail AKT, it's not that they haven't worked hard. It's not a lack of knowledge. It's exam technique. They either misread the question or one important part of it, or they misunderstood what the examiner is asking or how things are marked. So for example, if you look at the key features here, the patient's had a one month history. That's really important. And then what are the symptoms they've had? Tiredness, polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, and your classical diabetic symptoms. And that's why you suspect diabetes, right? So what the question is asking is which two of these results wouldn't allow you, wouldn't be suitable to confirm a diagnosis of diabetes, okay? You see, if someone's got symptoms that are typical of diabetes, like this patient, then a single fasting glucose or a single random glucose above the threshold, and this is above the threshold, Okay, this is above the threshold for a random, is enough to diagnose. Similarly, having two abnormal readings, you don't need two, but two would still be enough to um, uh, confirm a diagnosis. So why would this, because this is above the threshold, these two are both above the threshold. Why are they not suitable for this patient? The key is this bit here, the one month history. Okay, so if we look at generally how we diagnose diabetes, we use the WHO, World Health Organization criteria in the UK. If someone's got the classical diabetes symptoms, so you know, polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, they may or may not have weight loss with that as well. Um, you know, if they've got the typical symptoms, you only need one abnormal reading to make a diagnosis as long as at the threshold or above. So what are the thresholds? You need to know these because they won't give them to you in the exam. You need to learn it by heart. 
For a random glucose, 11.1 or more is enough. For fasting, 7.0 or more is enough. For HbA1c, 48 millimoles per mole or more is enough. For an OGTT, it's the same as the random at two hours, so 11.1, okay? If someone was asymptomatic, this patient had symptoms, right? If someone was asymptomatic, they need two abnormal readings on two separate days, same thresholds though. And if any, in any doubt, you, know, you do an OGTT, that's like the definitive, it will give you a, a clear answer, okay? So you can see this patient, HbA1c was above, it was 48 or more, wasn't it? If I go back to the patient, you can see it's 48 or more here, it's 48 or more here. Why are these two then not suitable for diagnosing diabetes? Because they've only had symptoms for one month. And HbA1c is a long-term measure. It's looking at your sugars over a longer period of time, two, three months, okay? So let me ask you a question, type into the chat. In which situations, maybe patients or patients within certain periods of their life or certain other illnesses or other situations, would HbA1c not be accurate and therefore not be suitable for diagnosis. Type into the chat. So someone said if a uh, patient was pregnant, okay? Someone else has mentioned if we were thinking about type one diabetes rather than type two, uh, if they were a child, so under 18, absolutely. If someone had chronic kidney disease. So that isn't enough. Just having CKD isn't enough. It's more specific than that, okay? So perhaps you could add to that. Someone mentioned if they're on medications that could affect the reading, like for example, if someone's on steroids, yeah? Um, if they've got certain other illnesses like sickle cell, which might impact the accuracy, okay? Great, you see, these are some of the things that we need to think about because it might change the accuracy and therefore the suitability of which test do we pick, okay? So you've got most of them, I'll just give you the summary. That these are the situations where you should avoid HbA1c for diagnosis because it won't be accurate. So you've got pretty much all of these between you. So children, you, it's just not recommended in children. So under 18, it's not accurate. If someone's pregnant, a few people mentioned that, but actually also if someone's recently given birth. So if you want to use HbA1c, you wait until two months after they've given birth, and then you could use it. Before that period, it, it's not accurate. If they've had symptoms for less than two months, so this patient had only had symptoms for one month, that's why it was inaccurate and no good for this patient. People at high diabetes risk who are acutely unwell. For example, if you had a patient with family history or from an ethnicity with a known high prevalence, and then they're acutely unwell, admitted to the hospital with a, a severe illness, during that phase, it's not accurate for diagnosis. If they're on medication that can cause hyperglycemia or affect the reading, someone mentioned steroids. If someone's got acute pancreatic damage, so that could include someone you know, who'd had surgery to the pancreas, for example. Um, a few people mentioned chronic CKD, so it's only end-stage CKD. If someone, for example, had CKD at the early stages, it's, it's still uh, accurate. And then someone with HIV, current active HIV infection, um, you should avoid HbA1c for diagnosis, okay? So do you see why for that patient, because they'd only had symptoms for one month, HbA1c, even though it was above the threshold, it's not accurate for diagnosis and therefore not suitable. All of them were at the right level. It was that seeing that that patient had only had symptoms for one month that's going to help you pick out the right answer, okay? So hard question. Let's move on to another one. Let's say now we have this patient. Here we go. Two popular answers were A and D. A was the most popular by a big margin. Continue current treatment, no changes needed. Now, in any question in the exam with the picture, it's important to both look at the picture and see what you can take from it and look at the scenario. So if we look at the picture first, what we see is the HbA1c is 49, okay? And then if we look at the scenario, we see this patient's come for diabetic review. He's on the top dose of metformin, 
and this is important as well, that he feels well in himself. So what's the most appropriate management? So the correct answer is A, which was the most popular, well done, but just over two thirds of you got that right, so well done. But lots of people picked various other options. So we're gonna look at why, okay? Why is it not add glycoside, which was the second most popular answer, or add citaglypsin or add pyoglitazone? Why are these not the correct answer? So this is where knowing the threshold is really important. So three really important numbers for you to remember in terms of management and the blood levels. They are 48, 53, 58, okay? So 48 millimoles per mole um, is the level for diagnosis of diabetes in patients where you can use HbA1c for diagnosis. We talked about earlier the ones that you couldn't use it for. But that's also the target if someone is on diet control only or if they're on monotherapy with something like metformin, i.e. first line of uh, treatment. 53 millimoles is the target if they're on dual therapy or drugs associated with hypos, like the sulfonylureas, glycoside, gabenkamide, okay? 58 or more millimoles per mole is the level where you want to start adding further treatment. So if we go back to our patient again, you can see as they're on 49, they're only just above target and they feel well in themselves. So we could just carry on with the current treatment. We don't need to make any change to the medication. What we might do is look at things like diet and exercise and other ways we can help them. Whereas if this had reached 58, that's when we're gonna start thinking we need to add in another treatment, okay? Or if it was here and they're feeling unwell, maybe they're having a side effect, maybe they're not tolerating it, then you might change it to something else. Or if you know they had worse control than this, maybe close to the border where we want to add more medication and they had additional risks, then again, you might think about adding something. Okay, so let's look at the guidelines for actual management. So metformin is a first line treatment for patients with type two diabetes who need medication, either maybe try diet control or even on initial diagnosis, if they're obese, we might think we want to reduce risk, we want to start medication straight away, not even try a period of just diet without medication. So what are the alternatives? Let's say someone didn't tolerate metformin. First of all, what's the most common side effect that leads patients to stopping taking metformin? Anyone know? Type into the chat. What's a common side effect for patients that start metformin? It's, it's particularly common in the first two or three weeks. Often, if they can get beyond that, it settles. So yeah, the most common one is GI upset. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, okay? You know, upset to the GI is the most common reason that patients on metformin, you know, stop taking, they don't tolerate it, okay? So let's say you had a patient, you had those symptoms, that, you know, just couldn't take it anymore, wanted to stop. What would be alternatives? as first line treatment, because metformin is now not suitable for them. Any thoughts? So a few people have suggested you could try modified release because sometimes that uh, causes less symptoms. Yeah, that would be an option, but let's say they just, they don't want metformin anymore. So what are the other options for first line treatment for monotherapy if someone's not going to take, just refuses to take it or try the MR because they've had these side effects and they've had enough, okay? So the answer actually is pretty much any of them, okay? So in the new guidelines, the 2019 and the current diabetes guidelines, if someone you know, doesn't tolerate it, or if there's a contraindication to metformin, the alternatives for initial monotherapy are basically any one of the other main four classes. So a glyptin, a glitazone, a sulfonylurea, an SGL2 inhibitor, okay? Second line is metformin plus any one of these for someone that can tolerate the metformin, okay? Third line, metformin in, in two of these, or at this stage, you could think about switching over to insulin. So actually, this guideline is one of the few that got a bit more straightforward in the current update, because a lot of the guidelines like COPD, uh, like hypertension, they got more complex in the latest version, okay? All right, so for those of you maybe starting to think about AKT, just to tell you that we've got lots of free support available for it. So, you know, if you're not already a member of the GP training support group or the AKT study group, someone in the team will post links to that, do join those. Um, near the time of the exam, we post a video every day with a question like this, answer, explanation, and a review of the relevant guideline. But also the previous edition, this is number 12 of the national VTS. But before that, we did lockdown learning. We did none of nine of those. So there's sort of 20 plus hours worth of this type of CPD sessions available on our YouTube channel, the eMedica YouTube channel. Again, someone will post a link to that. And then we have lots of uh, resources, courses, bundles for people that, you know, want additional support. So everything from our most comprehensive, you know, is complete. It's all you need. The AKT Pass Guarantee Program, 
220 hours, including two full day courses, nine webinars, over three and a half thousand questions, including full marks, including daily learning and a tailored individual learning plan. Um, down to our AKT Pass Plus bundle, which is 110 hours with four webinars and two courses, and then the individual bits. So we've got a full day AKT course, touch on exam technique, uh, key theory from all three domains, three teaching mini mocks, including one focusing on picture questions, ophthalmology, fundoscopy, ears, skin. Uh, our AKT Masterclass webinars, three and a half hours each, focusing on one domain. All the key stats topics in one evening, all the key admin topics in one evening, key high yield clinical topics from examiners reports. Um, our AKT 200 question crammer, which we have run in the past with the Royal College as a national revision course. So we do 450 question teaching mocks. Um, and then we go through rapid reviews. By the end of the day, we've covered 200 key topics, the relevant guidelines, and then you get access to a full mock afterwards, both with this one and this one. Uh, we also have a half day AKT masterclass, how to pass the AKT. You can find details of all of those on our website. And our AKT clinical case cards, the latest version, just published end of July 2021. So they've got the latest, for example, AF guidelines with the orbit bleeding risk tool. These have just been published. Okay. And then for those of you thinking about RCA, you know, again, having that knowledge that we've talked about, you could have a patient that you're seeing who the diabetes just been diagnosed, they don't tolerate their metformin, and you might be discussing what are we going to change them to, or someone with symptoms and thinking, what test should I do? And you want to discuss those things, that would be important. But because there have been so many changes to the RCA, we're actually going to hold a separate event just for that, the RCA Essentials webinar, that will be on the 11th of August at 7.30 p.m. Essentially, we're going to cover the format of the exam, how they're marking, the key changes for 21 2021 to 2022, because they made a lot of big changes that will come in from September onwards, including the updated mandatory cases, how to pick the cases to submit and why it makes a big difference to your chances of passing, reasons candidates lost marks in the past and ultimately failed and how to avoid them, and then the habits of those that don't just pass but smash it, the high scorers and how to pass RC. So that's going to be an hour, that's going to be on the 11th of um, August, okay, so um, I'll just pop the link for that into the chat. If anybody wants to sign up, you can do that. It's free. Okay. Um, that, that's really only for people who are in ST3, because those of you that are in just started ST2, by the time you come to it, this exam will be gone. Okay. Those of you in ST1, this exam will be gone. The new exam will have kicked in by then. But those of you that are in ST3 or about to start ST3 soon, you're going to have to submit the RCA. So I've posted the link for that. Okay. So I want to focus on the second half now. We've spent 25 minutes on that. I want to talk about key tips for starting a new job. Now, this could be whether you've just started training, whether you've just started ST2 or a new rotation, whether you've just started uh, life as a qualified GP. These are five things that I've seen from 20 years of doctoring and 16 odd years of training and teaching doctors that makes a big difference. OK, so these are the five things. Asking questions, remembering that teamwork makes the dream work, planning ahead, making time for your well-being, and then just focusing on one thing every day that you're going to learn or improve. I'm going to break each of these down into a bit more detail. OK, so the first is, you know, asking questions is so important. It's better to admit ignorance once. I admit that you don't know something and ask and then be enlightened forever than to pretend to be enlightened once and remain ignorant forever. So it's particularly important when you go into a new rotation. You could be a very experienced doctor, but let's say you've never done ENT and you start an ENT job. There'll be lots of things that you just haven't seen before. And it's important if you don't know something, admit that I'm not sure. Could you tell me how? Could you show me how? Uh, for those of you just starting in GP training for the first time, when you do your first re rotation in GP, things like the computer systems, because they're so different to what you use in hospital, it'd be completely new to you. So it's important that you ask and admit when someone tells you something and you don't know how. I would much rather have a junior doctor, a trainee, that asks me 100 questions than one that doesn't ask any. Because one that doesn't ask any, I don't think that they're awesome. I think that they're arrogant and that they think that they know it all. And I worry about them, that they're going to be unsafe. OK, so if you don't know something, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. You might feel shy, you might feel a bit embarrassed. You've got to overcome it. There are some things that you'd only see in GP. OK, and so it's important that you ask about them, because if you worked in hospital, and never been in GP, you never will have encountered it. So it's completely you know, expected that this will be new to you. Similarly, you know, for those of you just qualified and starting life as a fully qualified GP, there'll be certain things that as a trainee, you didn't need to think about that you need to think about. For example, if you've just qualified and you're working as a locum, 
when you're in training, you get paid every month and they've already deducted tax, national insurance. You don't need to fill in any pension form. They deduct pension at source. If you're locuming and you want to claim NHS pension for locum jobs, you've got to fill in locum A. You've got to get the practice to fill in locum B. You've got to submit this. You've got to work out the employee's contribution and which band you're in. You didn't have to think about any of these. So if you're not sure, you need to ask someone that's experienced and that's done it. You've got to think about saving money for your tax and national insurance bill, which is going to come a year and a bit later at the end of the tax year. And then you've got nine months after that. You know, if you're going to take up a partnership, you need to start understanding the accounts. If you have no clue, you need to get an accountant and pay them to help you go through it or go on a course that will teach you the basics of these things. You know, if you're going to be taking a salary job, you're going to think about what's the BMA model contract and how can I learn more about that? For those of you starting trading, you know, you might be completely new to the e-portfolio. Even if you had a portfolio in foundation training, the e-portfolio for trainees is completely different. You might not have got familiarity with some of the new assessments, okay, because they're not done outside of GP training. Even if you were a trainee in a different specialty and you had an IMT portfolio, the GP portfolio is different. So it's really important that you ask questions. Anything you're not sure of, ask someone more experienced, ask someone in the year above, ask in the GP training support group. It's the biggest group for GP trainees anywhere. There's 24,000 doctors in there. In every dean, we at different stages. We've got trainers and examiners and program directors in there. So ask and you'll see someone will give you an answer within a very short amount of time. It's a really helpful, supportive group. Again, someone will post the link to that. OK, so, you know, similarly, ask your su su supervisors, ask your registrars, ask someone seen it. Really, really important. They ask questions. OK, number two, remember that teamwork makes the dream work. You know, medicine is a team sport. So first things, you know, when you start any new job, Get to know your team, not just the other doctors, the nurses, the ward clerk, the physios, the district nurses, uh, you know, the, the other juniors, and, you know, the seniors. If you're starting as a qualified GP, you know, getting to know the different roles of the different people. You know, what does the practice manager support you with? You know, what are the roles of the secretary in that practice? That could be specific. For example, in some practices, the secretaries will actually dictate, take your dictation and type the letters and then you sign it. In some practices, you, you type your own referrals, like in our practice, we type our own referrals. OK, we don't have separate secretaries. I find it quicker anyway, you see. So, um, you know, you need to know who are the different people you need to go to get different kinds of help and different kinds of support. OK, but equally, you need to help and support others. You know, if you see someone struggling, give them a bit of time, ask them if they want to go for a coffee, if they need any help with something. If you happen to, you know, uh, have finished your tasks and got a bit of time free, I know that's not common, but one of your colleagues is, uh, you know, overwhelmed. You help them out. They're going to help you next time. OK, ultimately, you know, from the porter to the consultant and everyone in between, while we all got different roles, we are working towards the same goal. We want to do the best by our patients. And, you know, it's really important, therefore, that we work as a team and we show respect for the other members of the team, but also show an understanding of what their roles are. That's going to help you. OK. The next is planning ahead. Now, this is really important. You, you want to start planning and you need to set goals. You know, but they're at different levels. So we have short term thinking each day, you know, what are my tasks that I need to get done today? And what's the priority? So there might be some tasks. You've got a patient that needs a review that acutely unwell. And that's going to take priority over a patient that needs to be seen before discharge, but they're not acutely unwell right now. Then there might be some things that you know there's some teaching scheduled so you need to make sure I, i've got to get the most urgent jobs done the ones that can't wait so that i don't miss teaching because that's an important part of your development and your learning right okay you've got to think also weekly so that you can plan okay you know what we've got the vts teaching the half day teaching is happening on this day now in gp you have specific time off for that in hospital you can only go to that sometimes if all of your jobs are done and you know uh, you're not on call that day and things like that so you need to work around how to make sure that you can get to as many of those as possible. OK, um, in the medium term, you've got to think about setting goals and planning how you're going to get the most out of that rotation. How can I take the maximum learning that's going to help me develop my skills for when I'm a GP? So plan your year in advance. So think, OK, within that year, you know, when do I need to take annual leave? I'll come back to that when we look at well-being. You know, I'd like to go on this course, that course. So I need to plan ahead, make my swap so I can, uh, you know, have the day off to go on that course, apply for study leave in advance, uh, you know, use my study budget. Um, you know, it's important to look at what rotations you don't have and how you can get exposure to them. OK, um, you know, for each rotation, you need to have a smart PDP, specific, measurable. OK, um, uh, you know, 
we've done and looked at how to write a smart PDP for each rotation at earlier versions of this, but also in great detail at the GPST Plus course for new trainees. For those of you that are starting, that's a course that in a full day we cover all of the things in the ePortfolio, the different types of learning log, how to write a good PDP for each rotation, how to make the most of every rotation, how to cover gaps, other courses and qualifications that you might find helpful that are going to help you become a, more confident both during training and more competitive for jobs after training um, and how to make the most of your training. Um, you know, for those of you that are in ST2 or ST3, where you might be thinking about MRCGP AKT or MRCGP RCA or the new exam when you get there, you need to plan ahead so that you have a clear understanding of what's in the curriculum, which courses and resources do I want to do or use to help me pass it, when will I fit it into my year? You know, if you're going to say AKT, you need absolute minimum three months. For a lot of people, if you've got busy jobs, busy rotor, busy life outside of your work, you might need four, five, six months. You need to plan ahead when to start. You know, if you don't plan ahead, you might end up that, okay, you're in A&E and you think, you know, now the exam's up, I can't really study. You know, that, that's poor planning. Sometimes you have to because of other things, and then you're going to have to just work really hard and get through it. But what would be better is to plan around, a, you know, sitting an exam when, for example, you're in a GP rotation where you're not going to have as many nights or evenings or weekends, okay? And also the exposure in day-to-day -day cases is actually going to help you in your learning because the exam is GP focused, okay? Similarly, if there are additional courses and qualifications that you want to do to help you for your future goal, you know, you could be in a psych job now and you've got some study leave that you could use. You could use that to go on a course that's going to help you when you're a GP two or three years down the line. It doesn't have to be just related to psych, okay? And then you know, nobody gets exposure to all the specialties that will help them be a confident competent GP during GP training because you only get exposed to a few hospital rotations. Some of you might end up repeating things that you've already done in the past and not, you know, you might have no exposure to PEDS or psych or um, women's health or um, ophthalmology or ENT or dermatology, but all of these are helpful, aren't they, for when you are, you, you know, going to be a qualified GP because we're going to see everything. So you've got to think about how you can get that and how you can make the most out of your study leave because if you don't use it, it doesn't tend to carry over, you've lost it, okay? You want to make the use of your study leave to do anything that's going to benefit you in your long-term goals of being a, a great GP. And one of the things that you might find particularly helpful, because a lot of doctors told us that they sometimes struggled to get exposure to certain specialties, is each year we hold, you know, this is a one-hour national VTS, but once a year, we hold a national conference for GP trainees, the GP Training Live Conference. So just save the date for now. The date for the 2021 conference is Saturday, the 4th of September. It's going to be a full day, 9.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Um, we're just finalizing all the workshops, but so far the workshops that we're going to have are going to be GP-focused workshops on pediatrics from a GP who also works in pediatric emergency medicine for the last eight years. So he worked part of the week in GP, part of the week in pediatric A&E. So he's going to talk about, you know, what are the key peds conditions that you need to be confidently managing, how to spot the sick child, how to, you know, if you are starting peds, you're going to find it helpful. If you don't have peds in your rotation, something like that's essential to help you be more confident, okay? We've got a consultant psychiatrist who's going to do psychiatry for GPs. You know, the most common conditions, which are the ones you should refer to psychiatry, which are the ones to admit, which are the ones that we should be managing in GP, how to take a good psychiatric history, do a mental state examination. You know, again, it's going to help you be more confident. You're going to see a lot of psychiatry in GP. If you don't have exposure, it's important that you get exposure. We've got a consultant ophthalmologist who's going to do the, the key eye conditions, that we need to recognize which ones we need to admit urgently, which ones need a two week referral, which ones we can do a non-urgent referral or even try to manage in primary care and you know, look at some important cases. We're gonna have sessions. I'm gonna look at GP careers, different career options. What's the difference between a salary GP, a GP partner, a locum GP, a portfolio GP, how to look at pros and cons and, and think about developing these options. We'll touch on well-being and other trainee related topics. We've got, uh, GP that qualified last year, who's uh, doing different roles, who's going to talk about some of the tips and tricks she's picked up from her first year as a qualified GP, but also being a GP in the current climate of a pandemic. Okay, And all of the keynote sessions will be relevant whether you're an ST1, ST2 or ST3. Okay, There will also be a video recording available afterwards. Um, this is the sessions we had last year. So last year we had ENT, we had women's health, 
we had um, dermatology. So this year we're doing slightly different ones so that people that attended last year can get exposed to different things. These are some of the keynotes that we had. Um, we haven't finalized it and opened bookings, but um, someone on the team will post a, a link to the waiting list. Anyone on the waiting list, when we open bookings, we hope to open bookings on Monday next week, but anyone that signs up within the first couple of days, you'll be able to get a huge discount, okay? Um, so someone will post a link to the waiting list for this. We'll open bookings next week. Okay, the next tip, make time for well-being. You know, why is it whenever, I know a lot of us aren't getting on planes right now, okay? Whether because, you know, where we want to go is on the red list and we don't want to quarantine in a, a you know, a hotel when we come back or because just, you know, you would rather wait until things are a bit more open, not have to use part of your leave in, you know, quarantine at the other end or whatever. But, you know, one of the things that they always say to you in the safety demonstration, whenever you get on a plane, is that, in an emergency, if cabin pressure drops, oxygen masks will come on. Please put on your own oxygen mask before you help others or children. Why is that? See, if you don't look after your own well-being, you can't be an effective doctor to look after your patients, to look after anyone else. So it's really, really important that you make time for this. And as doctors, we're often not great at this. So some really important things. You know, when you start a new rotation or a new job, often because it's not just seeing the patients, you're learning a lot of things that are specific to that unit or that practice or that hospital, that that takes additional time. And in your ST1 year, you're also trying to master the e-portfolio. So sometimes I remember my first day on call when I was a house officer, that was 20 years ago, right? I graduated 2001. And I'd got to like nine o'clock and I realized that I hadn't had anything to eat all day because like one job or another and then a page and I didn't know how to do stuff. It took me much longer, twice as long as anyone else to fill in a lot of the forms. I didn't know where to find things. I didn't know who to ask about things. And you just, you know, you get busy from one job, one page or one call to another and you just totally forget until it just caught up and then you're overwhelmed. You know, it's really important that unless, you know, it's an arrest or something of that magnitude of seriousness and urgency, there are very few tasks that won't wait five minutes for you to have a coffee or 10 minutes for you to have you know a quick bite to eat have a sandwich you might not have an hour and have a three course sit down meal okay but it's really important you make time to fuel yourself to eat healthy food to you know have adequate hydration throughout the day you know water squash juice tea coffee but also to take your breaks you're entitled to breaks okay you're entitled to periods you know depending on length of session you have a certain amount of time that's really important that you take those breaks that you plan in time to each week to exercise and look after your own health. Because if you don't make time for, for this when you're well, you're going to have to make time for it when you're sick. And it's a lot more difficult then. Your mental health. GP training is really hard. Working as a qualified GP is really hard. We know there are high levels of stress, burnout. If you find that you're overwhelmed, if you find that you're struggling, if you feel that your mental health is being impacted, please get help. Talk to someone, talk to your supervisor, raise it, ask for help, talk to your own GP if you feel your mental health is being impacted. You know, sometimes you're going to need to take, take time off. Consider if less than full-time training might help you. I've seen some doctors who they were overwhelmed at full-time, just dropped one day a week and went to 80%. And just having that one day to themselves to do some of these other things, to, you know, get a bit of a break and break up their week made a huge difference. Yes, it's going to lengthen your training slightly, but look at the cost if they didn't do that and instead you know they, they continue to a point that they just couldn't take it anymore okay and that's one of the reasons why it's really important to plan your annual leave and your study leave because one of the things that's stressful is when you encounter a case or a situation or a patient and you don't know how to deal with it so if you plan your study leave, look at your areas that you're less confident in had less exposure in go on courses do e-learning you know do things like attend a conference so that you get exposure to these specialties that are missing it's going to make you more confident so that you know, takes away some of the stress the next time you encounter a patient with that condition but also even if you're not going abroad for holiday if you know that look i've got a week off coming soon it's something to look forward to psychologically it's a real boost to know look i've got you know, no matter how hard these days are, so I've got two more weeks and I've got uh, a week coming off, I can just rest. And, you know, um, like this year, we went to the Lake District. Uh, there's lots of places that you can visit within the UK where, you know, you can have a break and just get away and still do nice things. And even if you don't go anywhere, you can still just not being at work, having time to 
go for a walk, having time to do more exercise, having time to spend time with your family, with your loved ones, with your children, quality time. This makes a huge difference to your overall well-being and happiness. And that's important. It's going to make time for you. Okay, that's really, really important. Finally, one thing every day. James Clear wrote a book called Atomic Habits. If you want to look it up, Atomic Habits. Okay. And you know, if you just try to learn or improve on one thing every single day throughout the year, just spend five minutes just reflecting, okay, what did I see today that I could read up on and learn and you know be even if I don't master it, but I will be more confident when I see a patient with that next time. That what one skill I could practice, you know, just to improve a little bit. You don't have to become perfect or master it in one day, but just every single day, try to make sure at the end of the day you've thought about one thing, read up, learn, practice, just make one small improvement. Because if you can be consistent, then incremental improvements lead to greatness. So one of the things in this book, Atomic Habits, that he talks about, James Clear, is the power of tiny gains. That look, if you get 1% better every day at a skill or at something, Look what happens, 1.01 .01 to the power of 365, i.e. 1% better, but each day make that improvement. It ends up, you end up 37 and a bit times better than at the start of the year. Whereas if you don't do anything, you stay flat. Look what happens if you get 1% worse every day. You go to 0 0.03, okay? So i.e. you're about 30 times worse, basically 33 and a bit times worse than, than, than when you started, right? So, you know, just one small thing to really focus on and try to learn, but do it every day. By the end of the year, you've learned loads of things without even realizing, okay? So just to recap, you know, five key tips when you start any new job, whether that's a new rotation, a new year in your training, starting a new job as a qualified GP. Ask questions because you're never too experienced to not need to learn more. I've been a doctor 20 years now. I've been a GP since 2007. Okay, I've had my own practice five, six years now. To this day, you know, I was in clinic yesterday and I had to look something up. You know, I still have the BNF online version open. I still look things up on nice CKS. I still look things up on GP notebook, every clinic. I'll often still, you know, uh, discuss cases with my nursing colleagues, with, you know, uh, my other partner at my practice. You know, I'm still asking questions and still learning because when you stop learning, you stop living. All right, that's really important. Keep asking questions. Teamwork makes the dream work. You know, get to know your team, get to know the different roles, make use of them, support them, they will support you. Help them, they will help you. Ask for help when you need it. Plan ahead, plan your day, you know, prioritize what's most urgent, what's most important, what can wait, what can't wait, but plan your week, plan your month, plan your rotation, plan your year, plan, you know, what you'd like to achieve when do you want to sit your exams? When do you want to fit in time to go on additional courses? What study leave do you need? You know, make time for yourself to eat, drink, rest, to, you know, look after your mental health, your physical health, to do exercise, to spend time with your loved ones, to spend time on your hobbies. Doing things that you enjoy will help you as a healthy way to deal with the stress of our job. I can't take away that we've all entered a stressful profession. GP is stressful because it's such a hard job, okay? Training is hard because as well as the day-to-day -day care of your patients and the difficulties of the job itself, you've also got the e-portfolio, you've got exams to think about. It's hard, okay? So you can't take that away and make the stress zero, but there are healthy ways to deal with it. And part of that is to do these additional things, okay? You know, plan out your holidays and then focus on one thing every day that you're gonna learn, that you're gonna improve. And you'll see by the end of that rotation, how much better you are. By the end of that year, how much better you are. By the end of three years, how many times better you are, more confident you are, more skilled you are, um, it makes a huge difference, okay? So the rest of this session, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So anyone's got any questions, ask them in the Q&A and I will try to answer them, okay? So someone's asked about mandatory teaching in their scheme. Is there study leave used towards that? Yes, so you get nominally 30 days of study leave in a year, but 15 of those get taken away straight away to deal with the half day teaching that you get sort of every week for part of the year. Sometimes some more days will be taken with mandatory training or other training that your deanery organizes. So most people get about 10 days a year of usable study leave, but if you don't use it, it won't carry over to the next year. So you've got to make time and plan ahead. What courses would you like to get? What's your deanery's policy? They might have certain courses they approve, certain courses that they don't approve. They might have certain requirements like 
you know, if you happen to be on call on that day, you've got to find a swap. And if you can't find a swap, you can't have it. Or you've got to give six weeks notice and, you know, wait till three weeks before. There might be a space, you might not even be on call that day, but they might just say, I'm sorry, you can't have that day of study leave. You can't go on that course. And this is why it's important to plan ahead. Okay. Someone asked, how much is a live conference? It's £195 for the full day. And that includes access to um, the recording for a month afterwards. Okay. But if you sign up to the waiting list, then you will be able to get a big discount if you sign up within the first two days when we open bookings. Okay. Someone said, how do we apply for study leave in the GP practice? Each deanery has their own policy. So you need to contact your program director and read your deanery's policy. Okay. Someone said, can they request study leave for a course not related to their current rotation? Yes, you should be able to, as long as it's relevant to your development as a GP. However, each deanery has their own policy. So some won't approve certain courses or fund certain courses. Some will give you the time to go, but might not give funding. They're two different things. Someone's asked that they're struggling with the portfolio, how to use it, what to do, who do I ask for help? Well, you may get some training on that um, in the e-portfolio and so on as part of induction or when you have your VTS training over the next sort of, you know, several weeks. But if you would like to get a head start, if you go to our website, emedica.co.uk, this course is a full day course for people who are new to training, who are in ST1 or about to start. So we ran the live one in June, but you can now access the recording and we covered that in de great detail. So there's eight modules. So we cover key people, paperwork for GP, contracts, pay, leave, uh, money matters, how to increase your take home pay without doing any extra locums, expenses that you can claim, maximizing your tax uh, deductions and claims. Um, we covered medical legal issues. Why do people get complaints? How to avoid them? You know, we look at the rules and things that you can do to reduce your chance of complaints around confidentiality, consent, competence, uh, useful course and qualifications, how to cover other specialties, specifics of diplomas that you could do in training that might help you, like DRCOG, DFSIH, DCH, minor surgery, drug misuse, sexual health. Then there's a whole section on the workplace-based assessment, the e-portfolio, how to write learning logs, uh, PDPs, uh, ARCP outcomes, all the different assessment types, which ones to use where, that's covered in great detail. Then we covered the AKT, the exam format and some questions, uh, CSA, RCA and the new format exam that those of you starting will likely be sitting, portfolio careers, GP with specialist interests, how to get exposure and training, and then the secrets to be a great GP trainee. So you just click the subscribe now button and then you can select anywhere from one month to one year and just subscribe. OK, so that's a if you know, if you want to get a head start and get a really clear plan on all of them. Someone said, can they take study leave to prepare for the AKT? So, yes, you should be uh, able to take study leave to go on a course to prepare for AKT. Again, your deanery may have specific courses. For example, we run AKT courses with Health Education East of England and they automatically give all their trainees study leave if they want it and apply in time and fund attending that course. Um, similarly, we've run courses previously with KSS and they approved it for everyone that applied in time. Other deanries, they may approve some or all of some of our bundles or part of it or some of the courses. Some might have some courses run by the deanery. So they'll say, you know, we're running that. You can go to that. If you want to go to a different one, you know, you might have to, to they might give you study leave the day off. A lot of ours are on weekends anyway, so you don't need to take study leave if it's not convenient. But you just need to check with your deanery. In terms of private study, I some days to study just maybe coming up to the last few days before the exam. That's discretionary. So some deaneries will allow a few days, some will allow five, some won't allow it. It all depends. Again, you need to look at your deaneries policy. Someone said, if someone fails AKT fourth time, what could happen? So if someone fails AKT, first of all, if someone fails once, it's really important that they seek help, that they look at how and why they failed and get advice from people with expertise You can get support from the dean we we help people many people who are visiting to look at and understand why they failed because if you don't know why and you just repeat the same preparation again unfortunately you're likely to fail again and what you don't want to do is wait till you've failed four times or third time and it's your last attempt and then it's very very close and then start looking at this so, you know ideally if you prepare you know effectively allow enough time you should pass first time now, sometimes someone could work hard, prepare effectively, have a bad day, be unwell near the time. These things happen, right? But then it's really important that you get help and look at why and change your approach so that you pass next time. But if it happens that someone's failed fourth time, four times, in most cases, that would mean they would be asked to leave training. 
in exceptional circumstances, if they'd already passed RCA or CSA, they could apply for an exceptional fifth attempt with support from their program director and the RCGP. That's only given though, if they've already passed the other exam, the RCA or CSA. If someone hasn't, they wouldn't be given a fifth attempt. Um, and that would mean that they'll be asked to leave training. Someone asked, can they apply for less than full-time in ST3? I'll broaden it. You could apply for less than full-time at any point in training, okay? It can take a few months to organize. It might not always be possible to match you with someone to do it in certain jobs as much as you'd like, but yes, it's possible to apply for less than full-time at any point in training, okay? Someone said, can you take annual leave all in one go? No, that's unlikely. Usually you have to use your annual leave in that rotation. So if you've got two six-month jobs, you know, you'll have to use them in that job. You usually can't carry over. In some cases, you might be able to carry some of it over, but also I wouldn't recommend it. Imagine someone took all 27 days of their leave in one job. Now the whole rest of the year, you've got no leave to look forward to. You've got no leave. And then, you know, the tiredness builds up, the stress can build up. So usually it's much better. Now, sometimes if someone has to go abroad, they've got a specific family event and, you know, they need to spend a bit longer. I understand there can be exceptional circumstances. And sometimes you might be able to get two weeks in one go, for example, to do that. But generally, you wouldn't be able to take all your leave in one go. Okay. And generally, it wouldn't be a good idea. Someone said, what's the recommended time to ask questions while doing clinic? If you mean how many minutes, there's no set recommended time. But, you know, early on, if you have to ask about every patient, it's fine. Don't worry about it. You know, um, when I first started, nearly every patient I would be asking about. And you'll get maybe, as you get more experienced, more confident, more knowledgeable, you might find that you're not needing to ask as many. And again, for those of you starting in GP, because you're going to see a lot of things that you've never seen before. If you're a bit overwhelmed and you think, I'd like to just do some reading. The Oxford Handbook of General Practice, uh, fifth edition, is a good starting point. We also might find this helpful, our GP 100 case Cramer videos. So basically, if you watch this video, it explains how it works. But we cover for 100 cases, they're split into blocks of five. So you can see like Parkinson's, emergency contraception, dyspepsia, annual review of AF. And then the fifth one in every set is an interactive case with a simulator. We will see the, and for each one I cover, what are the key things to ask in history? What are the red flags you absolutely mustn't miss? What are the examinations you need to think about? What are the differentials? How to explain it clearly? What are the other things you need to think about in terms of psychosocial? Um, and then what are the current guidelines for management? It's up to date, it was updated this year, okay? Um, so, you know, there's a hundred cases and you can see the list of the different things that are covered are on there. So, you know, these are videos and it comes with a 360 page PDF booklet. The booklet is available separately. Some people just like to have printed things. So, you know, you can buy the booklet separately. It's 360 pages, okay, it's ring bound. Um, so, you know, you might find that helpful if you're starting out in GP and so sort of just want to get exposed before you come up to it for the first time and you have no idea. If you're already confident or have read and got some familiarity with a hundred important cases that you might see in GP, you know, it can make you feel a bit more confident in your job. Okay. Someone said, can we claim CPD for this webinar? We will send you a CPD certificate and uh, the recording once it's processed in a couple of days. Okay. Someone's asked, can you take RCA before AKT? You can, but remember you can only see RCA when you're in ST3. So that would mean not taking your AKT in ST2. Whereas most doctors like to get the AKT done in ST2 so that in ST3, they've only got RCA to focus on and then can focus on learning to be a GP. Okay. But if you wanted to sit both in ST3, you could sit the RCA first and then sit the AKT after. That's entirely possible. Okay. But you couldn't sit the RCA in ST2. Someone said, what type of work we usually do in out of hours? So you might be doing visits or you might be at the base doing telephone consult or seeing patients face to face, but it's GP work. Okay. It's just in a different setting. Thank you very much, everyone. If anyone's got any other questions, um, I need to get away now and have my dinner and pray. Um, feel free to email me or to send me a message. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. For those of you that have started training, welcome to training. For those of you that have finished training, welcome to life as a qualified GP, the fun part. For everyone else that's moved on, you know, welcome to the next stage in your journey. And I hope that, you know, we can be a part of it and help and support you throughout. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.